Good morning, almost afternoon, everyone. My name is Sue Burton. I'm co-chair of the Second Tuesday Forum. Um, Mary Hodges, who you have probably seen walking around handing out our flyers, is the other co-chair. Um, the director is Todd Elliott. Um, and there are library board members here and um, our esteemed uh, Second Tuesday Forum member, Mrs. Alma Riven, is going to do the introduction in just a moment. Uh, I wanted to make sure everybody saw our flyer. This is actually our 20th season. Last year was our 20th year. And uh, so we are so pleased to welcome everybody back and to see a lot of new faces. And I know everybody is a patron of the Chrysler Museum of Art and you're dreadfully missing that they are not open, although they have some wonderful alternatives out there and that's what we're gonna hear about. So Zelma, if you could do the honors, please. realize how lucky we are to have Bill Hennessy with us today because now that the word is out that he's retiring from the Chrysler I'm sure his time will be gobbled up by eager audiences such as you so we're very very lucky to have have made uh, agreed to his commitment to come here long before we knew or maybe he knew that he was about to retire I'll tell you a little bit about his credentials because I think it's important to know that. He's been director of the Chrysler for 16 years. Sweet 16. <laughs> And before moving to Hampton Roads, he was director of the University of Michigan Museum of Art, where he worked for eight years. Earlier in his career, he directed the University of Kentucky Art Museum and the Vassar College Art Gallery. Hennessy also taught art history at each of these universities and held curatorial posts at the Guggenheim in New York and the Spence Museum of Art at the University of Kansas. Mr. Hennessy, who recently turned 66, holds a Bachelor of Arts degree in Art History from Wesleyan University and a PhD from Columbia. He studied management at the Columbia University and University of Michigan Schools of Business and has held a prestigious Ford Foundation Museum Curatorial Fellowship at the Worcester Art Museum. Over the past 36 years, he has published numerous ex exhibition catalogs, essays, articles, and reviews, and is a frequent lecturer. He was here, oh, I think, four or five years ago. I hope you all remember that. Speaking most often on issues involving the way that art, people, and museums interact. In 2012, Lead Hampton Road selected Bill Hennessy as the region's 2012 visionary leader. I'm so proud and so delighted and honored to present Bill Hennessy. Thank you so much and uh, appreciate your inviting me to journey across the river and to, uh, to meet with you again in this wonderful, wonderful setting. Uh, I have um, kind of good news and bad news for you today. This is the, this is the bad news part. Uh, may not be news at this point since the, the Chrysler has in fact been, been closed up, at least the main building's been closed up, for uh, a bit over a year now. And uh, what I'd like to do today is talk to you a bit about why uh, that's the case and uh, what's been going on in the meanwhile and what you can look forward to. Uh, in the spring of 2014 when we take that sign down. So, well, the reason we're closed, of course, is a major expansion and renovation of a building on Mowbray Arch there in Norfolk that's, that's our home. 
And this is something we've been talking about for a number of years. And there are a number of reasons that it's happening. So uh, we say, well, the museum's been around since, uh, gosh, really, 1971, when Walter brought his price, Kleiser brought his collection here. And uh, during that time, this has been our mission. We say we really exist to enrich and transform people's lives. We want the world to look different to them after they visited the museum than it did before. And we do that by bringing art and people together through programs that we hope will, uh, uh, I say, delight, inform, and inspire. And uh, since 71, that's been our mission with the Chrysler Collection, but the museum actually goes back to 1939, so we've been around for a while. Unfortunately, so is our building. So we said a while back we need to, to, to address some issues. And I'm not sure how many of those you can, you can read up on the screen, but we said we have a number of challenges that face us with our building. Uh, we have uh, run out of space, quite literally. We have 30,000 works of art in our collection. We know that there are other works that are in private collections here in the community that we'd like someday to come to the Chrysler. But how can you make a case to a collector to give you their paintings if you haven't got any place to put them up? So we needed more gallery space. And then we needed better space in which to store those works and make them accessible that weren't on view at any moment in time. So then we said, well, that's number one. And then there's some other things we need to address. For example, if you try to find your way around the Chrysler Museum, you've discovered that there, um, there's some circulation problems in the old building. If you wanted to go from the front to the back, there's an elevator smack dab in the middle of the corridor that you wanted to go down. So you had to make this circuitous detour around the back. And then uh, if you went to our, our little cafe, our restaurant, uh, you discovered that the menu was a bit limited because the restaurant was in the center of the building, so it couldn't have a kitchen. They could only warm things up. And in addition to that, all of the food in the morning and all the trash in the afternoon had to be dragged out through the galleries where there were works of art. Or if you've come to a sit-down, a catered dinner there, what you, I hope you didn't know, is that your food was as likely or not cooked on our loading dock because we didn't have a proper kitchen. These are some major logistical challenges. Uh, if you were a disabled person, or if you happened to come with a stroller, you couldn't come in the front door because there was a flight of steps. You needed to kind of scuttle around to the side of the building. So we felt we needed to, to fix that. And then one of the biggest parts of the project, and one of the least visible, is the, uh, the fact that our air conditioning systems, many of them were installed in the 1930s, had really reached the end of their workable life. They were tied together with duct tape and bailing wire, and they were <laughs> gobbling up huge quantities of, of, of energy they needed to be fixed. So we could keep the kind of steady temperature humidity in our galleries that works of art demand. So we needed to remedy that. And then we said, while we're at it, we need to upgrade our lighting system. There are 18,000 lighting fixtures in the Chrysler Museum that, again, use lots of electricity. We wanted to update those to use new LED technology so it would be a, a greener place, uh, less uh, consumptive of, of natural resources, and uh, also less consumptive of our tightly pressed budget to keep that going. So we gave all of these challenges that we felt that the museum faced to an architect and said, figure out how to solve it. And this is what he came up with. He said, I think what we need to do is put two wings, one on either side of the main entrance. In other words, we're going to pull the museum out from its current building by about 30 feet into what's now the go-to gardens that flank the entrance. And then we're going to move those gardens out 30 feet closer to, to the Hague Inlet. And that's going to give us new space that's going to enable us to solve these other problems. So on the first floor of the, the new Chrysler Museum, there are a couple of things you can look forward to. Uh, over, uh, over on the uh, left-hand side there, in the, the purple area, that's going to be our new restaurant and catering area. Uh, the restaurant will be about twice the size it was before. It'll have a proper cooking kitchen. 
It'll have a beautiful terrace that'll let you eat outside in, in, in good weather. And it'll have its own loading dock so we won't have to drag the, the food through the, the art space. We'll also have a, a proper catering facility and easy access to the central courtyard where most of our major rental events take place. So that's that uh, sort of purple color on, on the left-hand side. Then on the other side of the building, the area that's uh, light blue up there on the screen, those are going to be new galleries for our glass collection. You know, the Chrysler's uh, signature, really, in the art world is those 16,000 pieces of glass that let us tell the whole history of Western civilization from Egypt right up to the present day through that one medium. And as we planned this, we said that's one place where we really do need more room. It's the place where our collection is expanding the fastest. So this new addition will let us add about one third to the size of the galleries for, for glass. At the same time, we also were watching our visitors to the old glass galleries. And uh, we discovered something interesting happening. When those galleries were installed in the 1980s, uh, not much of the glass collection had been on public view. So the philosophy then was uh, to bring as much of the material out so people could see it uh, at one time. That's sort of the shock and awe uh, approach to, uh, to, to display. And it did shock and awe people. People said, we had no idea all this material was here. It's so impressive. And then they said, but it's also a little oppressive. You know, by the time we get through these galleries, we're exhausted. There's simply too much to look at. And because there's so much on view, there's no space left for the kind of interpretive and informative material that answers our questions about the collection, that helps us understand why we should care about these objects. So we're reinstalling in this new larger space our glass collection to have fewer objects on display, but to tell what we hope is a more compelling and easily comprehensible story. Galleries also have a little space in the center, since we're reducing the number of objects that'll be on regular view, where we can do changing exhibitions drawn from the collection. So four or five times a year, those, uh, those displays will change over. So that's the blue part. Then the red part, right in the center there, our new galleries for our ancient worlds collections, our collections of, uh, of uh, Mesoamerican and Egyptian, uh, classical, African, and Asian art. Uh, these were galleries in the old building that had been installed in the 1970s and were very much feeling their age. Uh, very little dis interpretive material, the arrangement wasn't very good. Again, they didn't tell a story. So we'll have a whole new and, and larger space for them as well. And then finally on the ground floor of the museum, the green area that you see there is our new main entrance with new ramps that will let disabled people come right up and into the, the front of the museum very easily. Be a new lift inside and ramps on the outside. Upstairs on the second floor of the building, new things in store too. The, the two yellow areas are new galleries for our European and American painting and sculpture collection. And then the uh, sort of salmon colored area in the back there is for our contemporary art collection. If you remember the 20th and 21st century galleries in the old Chrysler, they were kind of a warren of smallish rooms, some of them with rather low ceilings that pressed down on some pretty big paintings. Well, we've opened that space up now completely. It's become uh, almost like a, a giant artist's loft with movable walls, so it'll be flexible and uh, we think a much more exciting place to, to see works of art. And we've taken the gallery at the very back of the building where the James Rico collection of American sculpture used to be displayed, and we're converting that into an additional space for contemporary art, with the Rico collection being relocated really where it belongs, and that's with all the other historic American art at the front of the building in those yellow spaces. Those are uh, the kind of spatial changes, and behind the scenes, all that new air conditioning and lighting is going in at the same time. Another decision we made early on is, um, is one that I think every museum faces when it, it looks at an expansion, and is that is what should it look like? You know, many museums thought, you know, well, if we're building a new building or expanding our old one, this is the time to make an architectural statement. 
to have them to create a building that uh, uh, has a strong and individual personality of its own. Um, as our trustees talked about this, people said, well, gosh, folks actually like the way the Chrysler looks, and, and maybe we shouldn't monkey around with it too much. So uh, we're not. Uh, the, uh, the top picture here is what the Chrysler looks like now, and the bottom picture is what the Chrysler will look like after the renovation is complete. And if you look very hard, you see there's some subtle differences. But uh, we're hoping that for the average person, after we finish, they won't know we did anything. But at the same time, the museum will be larger and work better than it did before. When we talk about the Chrysler too, we, we try now to think not just in terms of our main building, but of what we're calling our campus. And the campus includes the main building and also our glass studio, which I'll talk with you about uh, a little bit more. It's in the former Wachovia Bank building down there at the uh, lower part of that red square. So as part of this renovation, we're finding ways to tie those two buildings together and at the same time improve parking. So you can look forward to everything within that red line becoming uh, in the next couple of months a kind of a sculpture garden with some meandering paths and a good deal more outdoor sculpture better placed to help people make a smooth and easy connection from their cars to the museum and from the museum to the glass studio and back again. All of this is moving, moving ahead. Well, what did we have to do to, to make all this happen? Well, the first thing we needed to do was get the art out of the spaces that the work was gonna happen in. And since we're touching virtually every room in the building, that meant moving literally every single object in the collection. And to do that, um, sometimes it was very easy. You can pick up a small teacup and pack it up pretty well, but if you've got a 7,000 pound Egyptian sarcophagus, the, the, the task is a little more complex. So what you see here is that sarcophagus in its galleries being prepared by a, a team of conservators to be, be lifted and gotten out of the way. Uh, or here, a, a group of our staff members are rolling up and carefully packing a 16th century Flemish tapestry for, for storage. Or what happens if you've got a Gothic doorway that's literally built into the museum that needs to come out because a car is going to go through there? Well, you bring in a group of special conservators who build a frame around that doorway in place and then just cut it out and haul it away. So you see the, the Gothic doorway there on your left and the hole that was left there when it was removed on the, on the right. Then sometimes we ran into kind of unexpected problems. Uh, on, the, on the wall in the back of this room is our great Thomas Cole painting of the angel appearing to the shepherds. One of the biggest pictures in the Chrysler's collection. A picture so large, in fact, that it doesn't fit through any of the doors in the room in which it's shown. So what, what's the solution? Well, if we can't take the picture out to permit construction to go ahead, we, uh, we need to leave it there. And uh, what you see being constructed in the foreground is a, a moving storage room for that painting. It's a special frame um, that's being constructed. Painting has been fitted into that frame and it's on wheels so we can move it from one side of the room to the other safely to allow work to go on around it. Because it's one of these flexible and creative solutions that people need to come up with sometime. Then there are storage areas. If we're taking works out of the galleries, uh, we need to put them in safe and secure storage places so the work can continue. This is what the, uh, the main storage area on the top floor of the museum looked like uh, at the start of our construction project. Uh, it's, it's frankly a little bit of an embarrassment. In fact, it's a lot of an embarrassment. It, uh, <laughs> and one of the nice things this project has enabled us to do to say, you know, that storage area is needed updating for decades. Now's the time to do it and to fix it up so it can hold the new works we need to put in there during construction and also afterwards. So here's the after. Um, after we got through renovating the storage area to hold the collection that we needed to take out of the galleries. So with the works of art out of the building, 
construction can begin, and it did in earnest. This is in the knock it down phase of construction, and you see there's a lot of knocking down that, 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 that took place. Um, I mentioned that uh, one of our challenges in the old building was that the elevator was in exactly the wrong spot. So he said, let's move the elevator. So they've, what you see here is a new elevator shaft being cut through four floors of the center of that building yeah, in a pre-existing structure. I uh, mentioned the air conditioning equipment. Well, here on the top, you see uh, uh, our old chiller being taken out. And uh, then on the lower picture, a new two-ton chiller being lifted into the museum by a crane over the top of a skylight. It's one of our scarier days. Uh, we, needed, uh, we needed new roofs in certain part of the building for uh, our new skylight galleries and our new porch. And here you see them putting up the... Uh, uh, the steelwork and pouring the concrete for, for some of those areas. And then if we're moving the porches out towards the, the river, uh, we needed to take down limestone columns and put them up. So this is a, a lot like erecting the Parthenon in 300 BC. It went on where they're putting up our new, new Parthenon columns outside. Now we're putting things back. Uh, this is the interior of one of those new skylit galleries that I mentioned. You can see it's a beautiful, large, commodious space. The skylight is in, and what's being installed here are the new air conditioning ducts. But you'll get some sense of the, the scale of these new spaces that are being created. And then the walls have started to go back up now. This uh, is about two weeks ago, uh, where they're, they're actually hanging plywood and in drywall and in some of the new spaces. If you find some of these pictures interesting, and actually even if you don't, this is worth looking at anyway, I'd encourage you to go to our website. Uh, we have a, a fellow on our staff who is a fabulous photographer, and he runs a construction blog. So if you go to Chrysler.org and click on our expansion and renovation blog, you can follow the uh, progress of the museum literally in real time. He posts new pictures of what's happening around the museum every day there. And sometimes he'll even do a video on there too. So I would urge you to visit the website and take a look. What I'd like to do now uh, is sort of um, dig down a little, little closer. Uh, we've talked in general terms about uh, uh, moving those 30,000 objects out of the way and then getting them ready to put back in place. And this is a little presentation that uh, uh, our registration department said, well, let's trace one single object in the museum's collection over the last couple of months and see what's had to be done to it. So let's, well, if we follow that journey, um, we start with the computer record and we have a separate computer database entry for every one of those 30,000 objects. And the object in this case, you'll see a teeny image of it there on the right-hand side, is a small glass bunch of grapes. It was probably made as a Christmas tree ornament sometime in the, the early years of the 20th century. Uh, we don't know who made it or where it was made, but it's a nice little object, and our hope is to put that on display as part of our new installation. So we start with the computer record to find out where that object's currently located. And it said it was in a really terrible storage room on the top of the museum. So our registrar went upstairs and found that object that our designers wanted to put in the collection. And uh, then they said, well, we, we've got to pack that up so it's safe during the renovation. So we acquired unbelievable quantities of pellets and bubble wrap and things like that that you see here. Uh, and here's, uh, here's the registrar uh, preparing little packets for the glass object. And, and they were put in boxes and moved to our new and upgraded storage area. And uh, then they were sealed up and put away for a couple of months. And then they were uh, placed on a shelf, all wrapped up and carefully labeled. Then uh, time came to begin thinking about reinstalling that. This is now just several weeks ago. Took the box off the shelf, took the piece out, and we turned it over to uh, a mount maker. Uh, this is a, a fellow that uh, has come and is resident with us whose job it is to make a little armature 
that enables us to display safely and securely that glass bunch of grapes on the back wall of a showcase. So he's taking a look there, he's measuring it, he's bending some special brass wire to come up with a thing, he's designing this from scratch, there he is, he's fitting it onto the, the glass bunch of grapes there in his hand. There's the, the armature pretty much fitted onto it. And that's what it looks like when it doesn't have the glass on it. So it's a very complicated custom-made thing. There he is fitting it on. Now what he's doing is uh, beginning to, to paint it so that the color of the mount matches the color of the glass grapes so you don't see it. Here he is mixing his colors. There he is painting it on there. And finally when it's done, it pretty much disappears, doesn't it? So, well, what happens next? The mount's ready. Well, we wouldn't want to put anything on view that didn't look its very best, so we needed to wash the, the bunch of grapes to get off 100 years of grime. Well, do you throw it in the dishwasher? Probably not. So here's our conservation intern who using, um, let's see if I can get this right, a non-ionic surfactant, uh, I asked her what that was, she said soap and water. Um, and a Q-tip, she's going over and cleaning every, uh, every inch of that, getting all the grime off. And then, it's clean, it has its mount ready. We have to refine a little bit exactly where in the galleries and in each individual showcase that's gonna be. Um, it's hard to see on the slide, but if you look at the upper left corner, top row, Second object from the left, that's our grapes. And what you're seeing here is a detailed case layout with every single object placed that our designers have, have created for the gallery. We'll zoom in a little bit. There's the bunch of grapes there, the one that's labeled uh, 0 0.1007. And that is, in fact, the actual showcase as it looks under construction now in our galleries where that bunch of grapes is gonna end up. And there's the zooming in to see the, the actual spot. And uh, the next thing is to say, all right, we're gonna change the location in our database to say it's not in storage, it's not with the mount maker, it's not being cleaned, it's actually gonna be moved into that showcase and uh, we'll have its permanent home there. It's a lot of work for one object. In the glass galleries, there are going to be about 1,600 objects on display. This process has to be repeated just for glass 1,600 times. <laughs> so you can, you know, people say, you know, the museum's closed for 16 months. What are you all doing in there? You know, you're just sitting around having donuts and coffee? Well, far from it. Uh, it's been a very busy time. Oh, well, other things happening, uh, not just about glass or ancient worlds, it's also about painting. So here's our, our conservator, Mark Lewis, who's uh, sprucing up a number of our pictures. We're also working on the frames for some of our paintings so that the works are, are presented their best when we reopen. Uh, here's the process uh, of arranging uh, cases of porcelain that's, that's underway there. And then for every single gallery, and there are about 63, I think, galleries in the new museum, uh, we have a detailed plan like this that's been worked out. Begins with at the bottom there, that's a floor plan, a top view of the gallery. And then for each of the four walls of the gallery, we do an elevation that places paintings in the right order. And our curators will do that, they'll work with our designer, they'll say, you know, that really doesn't look right, or this would look better somebody. So you move it around, and then you move it around eight more times, and this is all a, an ongoing organic process. But the goal is, when we finally get the, the galleries back from the contractors, our team can go in there and they'll know exactly where to put each picture, rather than having to figure it out on the spot. Oh, excuse me. Let's give you some more of these, uh, these gallery views. You may recognize some familiar pieces there. Uh, you probably will not recognize some of the works that are, that are on these slides because they haven't been on view because we haven't had that gallery space. And this expansion is going to let you make a lot of new friends. Um, 
well, what's, what's happening while all of this is going on? You know, um, is, you know, are all the works of art involved in this conservation and reframing and mount making process? By no means. Uh, we are lending very actively from our collection so that it's out and working, in this case, around the world. And these two little maps show you where Chrysler pictures have been in the last 12 months. As you see, they've been all over the United States and Canada and uh, all, over, all over Europe from um, Berlin to Edinburgh to Paris to Rome uh, and on and on. And the Far East, we have a number of things in Japan at the moment, uh, not even on here. And they're also visiting a little closer to home. Uh, for example, if you were just to uh, walk diagonally across the street to the, the, the Visual Arts Center, you'd see a wonderful show uh, that was put together as a partnership between TCC and the Chrysler called Art That Asks the Big Questions. And uh, if you haven't seen it, you really should, because it's fabulous works of art arranged by, by Shelley over there to tell a real story. In fact, here's uh, Jeff Harrison at the opening uh, of that show doing a, a fabulous gallery talk about the Chrysler's pictures. Uh, downtown in Norfolk at the Willoughby Baylor House uh, on Freemason Street. We've uh, taken that historic house and turned it into a gallery for our very best American pictures. So you can see about 40 of America's finest painters represented there. And that'll be up through December. Uh, down the block at the Moses Myers house, uh, we've done something a little different there. Uh, we've commissioned a contemporary artist to design a site-specific work of art inspired by the house, its history, and its contents, and created entirely in the museum's glass studio uh, to go in the house. And this is what it looks like. It's called Adeline's Portal. It is literally thousands of glass objects, every one of which was made in the museum's glass studio, and every one of which reproduces an object in a different medium that was in the Myers house. You'll see, uh, um, for instance, down at the, um, the lower left there, that's a, a bamboo bird cage that's been reproduced in glass. At the back wall, is a glass sampler inspired by a small needlework sampler that uh, Adeline Myers herself did. Uh, you'll see a pocket watch made out of glass. You'll see candlesticks, glasses, um, even, uh, even some glass bricks that are uh, inspired by the house. This is really worth seeing. It's a great surprise to encounter in the 18th century house, this very contemporary work. Well, I mentioned that this was all fabricated in our glass studio, and I think probably at the moment the liveliest thing going on at the Chrysler is our glass studio. It's a, it's a wonderful place where every day you can watch and for yourself try out making glass. Uh, you know, uh, uh, when, I, when I grew up, my idea of glass making is what happens up in Jamestown, the little glass thing. You know, every day, those poor guys up there turn out the same boring little green bottles, <laughs> one after one. I still got mine that I, I got when I was a kid. Um, that's very common at, at glass studios. Our folks at the, the Chrysler studio said, you know, people don't come for the studio because they want to take home a green bottle. They come because glass making is by its very nature a wonderful theatrical dramatic visceral experience they want to see a show a performance so glass making in our studio is a performance uh, and it's a uh, performance of very kind you can try team glass blowing here for people blowing a bubble at the same time or you, you can watch them uh, uh, make glass change colors um, you can watch visiting artists make things like 50 pound ice cream cones out of molten glass. Or you can watch uh, visiting artists like Deborah Teresco here last uh, December attempt to break the record for the largest glass Christmas tree ornament ever fabricated. And she, uh, I, th I think she came close. Um, sometimes um, uh, we do a little bit different things. Uh, for instance, on the third Wednesday of every month, there's a special performance that's organized by the students in our glass studio. In this case, it was a, a, an Iron Chef 
competition. You know, one of these cooking things like on television? The, the, the wrinkle in our case was is that you had to use hot glass to cook the food. You couldn't use a stove or, or a frying pan. So uh, if you want to long, learn how long it takes to cook a steak, just I'll flop it on top of a 2,000 degree slab of molten glass and it, it cooks pretty fast. So, <laughs> in this case, they had a panel of judges. They, it, was, it was a lot of fun. Uh, or, um, extraordinary evening. This is a, a pair of artists named Bo Yun and Kishibashi, uh, classically trained musicians. And what you see here is Bo Yun on the left hand side, who has made glass instruments out of tubes of, of, of glass. And by heating those tubes up with a blowtorch, he causes them to make an extraordinary eerie sound. So by heating up tubes of different sizes at different intervals, he plays music. And it sounds gimmicky. It was unbelievably beautiful. Uh, and happens nowhere else in the world except in our studio. Or sometimes they just have fun. For instance, if you ever wondered, can you build the Parthenon out of glass? Here's an effort. <laughs> and then I think maybe the trademark of programs at the Chrysler Glass Studio is there's never a program that something isn't set on fire, just to, to, to keep it exciting. And you'll likely to see something like this over there, too. And if you come to one of the free demonstrations every day at noon over there, or one of these more experimental Wednesday evenings, and you, you say, you know, I'd really like to try that. We say, absolutely. Uh, we have classes for all levels of people and, and all ages, and it's, uh, it's kind of addictive. Glass Studio doesn't only exist, by the way, in uh, that building uh, next to the Chrysler, but we also have a mobile hot shop that, that takes to the, the streets. It, uh, it's appeared in, uh, in uh, I think it was at the Seawall Festival here. It's been out in Chesapeake and all over, over Norfolk. It's a trailer that uh, has a, a mobile glass making studio in it. So all of that is going on. Um, part of what makes plans exciting for the new Chrysler, our new building, our new campus, loans and projects across the, the community and uh, around the world. So I would invite you to, to, to mark your calendars for uh, April of 2014 when all of this will We'll reopen with a series of, of wonderful parties, and uh, I sure hope you'll be there. Thank you. <laughs> Absolutely, I think we're more than willing to, to try to tackle some questions. Yes. I, I, this is all very fascinating and exciting. I am stuck on these niche workers. That where do you find these people? Mount makers and. Uh, I didn't even know these jobs exist. <laughs> right, it's true. Uh, with the mountain maker, you, you picked a wonderful example. There are only about two of these guys in the entire country. They're in tremendous demand. This fellow, whose name is Bob Fugelstock, comes from Williamstown, Massachusetts, and we have to schedule him six months in advance to come down and spend a week or two with us periodically over this, uh, this period. So it, it's a, a very specialized. Uh, our designers out of Washington, D.C., and there are maybe half a dozen firms that do that. But it, uh, it's a whole other world. It's very small, right? I mean, this is a very small industry. It is. To support this. Right. Wow. If you figure there are maybe 175 um, good sized art museums in the entire United States, it, uh, it's a small thing. Thank you. Yes? How did the big painting get into the room? <laughs> Good question. Good question. How did that Thomas Cole painting that can't get out get in? Um, well, uh, the answer is uh, it was put in there in 1988 when the last renovation of the museum was done, and they got it in the room before they framed in the doorways. Um, so by the time they, you know, took a, a rough opening and, and put molding around it and trim work, the door got too small and let it out. You, know, you can say it's a little bit like that great story of you know, building the boat in the basement, uh, but 2020 hindsight. Yes? Are, are these local construction workers um, that you're using, a local, is it a local business? Right. Uh, the, um, the contractor for our building is a company called KBS. Uh, they're headquartered in Richmond, and they have a, a large branch office in Chesapeake. 
and you, you uh, contributed to the good economy. Of Absolutely. Uh, and there are a bunch of them on this job. Uh, I think yesterday the, the manager told me there were 85 guys working on that building. Yes, yes as the parking facility been enlarged. I'm sorry, say again? Has the parking facility been enlarged? Um, has the parking improved? Um, we have, I think, eight more spaces than, than we had before. Um, we've just run out of space. Uh, we do have a plan for the future that we're working on with the city of Norfolk for actually a deck structure, but that's, that's a good number of years and uh, a, a good deal of fundraising away still. So we hope that on most days, you'll be in pretty good shape. Was anything done during the uh, renovation to address the flooding? Ah, one of the biggest questions, um, that, you know, what about flooding? We are, as a community, uh, in really grave danger, and the museum in particular, because of its location, is, is in a pretty tricky spot. I was almost like coming here today because I couldn't get out of the museum one way because the water was too deep. Um, we've, uh, we've done all that we feel we can reasonably do. Um, the uh, the I can tell you the museum's main floor is 11 feet above mean high tide. The, the highest we've ever gotten is about eight. So water has never come in the building. Uh, we used to have um, a number of um, small rooms in the basement of the museum with uh, um, boilers and, and electrical equipment. We've taken all of that out and moved it up so there's nothing at below grade level now. Uh, we've installed a truly huge emergency generator so that we can maintain power even if we lose city electricity in the building. And uh, we've installed a, a series of, uh, of floodgates that we actually bought from a company in Venice, Italy uh, that protect the main entrance of the museum. There are gates that we drop in if we feel we have flooding. So short of a, a, a disaster of uh, truly you know, sandy proportions, we, uh, we should be okay. And we, of course, have a, a plan, uh, a disaster plan to get things moved to, to higher levels, should the sea rise. Uh, are you still displaying things in the dark, dark center? Uh, do we have things down at the dark center? I thought you might mention that. Thank you, absolutely. Um, and not so much at the dark center itself, but one of the so-called roadshow locations that the Chrysler's had over the last year is a storefront in Selden Arcade in downtown Norfolk, just off, off Main Street, uh, where we've done a series of, uh, of, I think, very charming shows. One was about, uh, uh, about shopping, since we're in a shopping location. Another one was about uh, pets. And we currently have a, a, a more theoretical show that's about time down there. And each month on the second Saturday, we've done a family day, and those have been in partnership with uh, our wonderful friends at the, the Dart Center who are on the, just across the, the, the arcade from us. So yes, that's still up and very much going till, till December. Thank you. You had a wonderful gift shop before. I didn't see that in the configuration. Ah, we're, we're not gonna monkey with the gift shop too much. It's staying where it is, exact same location. We've. Uh, we put another window in it so it's uh, it's more visible. Hopefully, it'll lure some more shoppers in that way. Uh, it, it's going to be uh, absolutely spruced up with new fixtures, and new lighting, and new colors, and uh, uh, a new uh, kind of selection of merchandise. Uh, we really like it to be a place that has things that you really can't find anywhere else that people want to come to. So yes, gift shops coming back. Yes. How is the project being funded? Good question. Um, now, expansion is part of a much larger capital campaign that the museum is just finishing up now. Um, the campaign altogether is $45 million, a lot of money. And uh, thanks to that campaign, we've been able to create the Glass Studio. That was the first component of the campaign. Uh, we've also been able to put endowments in place that fund the salaries of key curators and educators, and other staff members at the museum. So uh, it's helped our operating budget. And then the third component, $24 million, is the actual expansion. And in this, we've been very, very lucky to have had very generous gifts 
uh, lead gifts from a number of members of the community, and, uh, and also a, uh, a matching commitment for a part of that from the city of Norfolk, who's making uh, an investment as well. And we are about $2 million from meeting that whole $45 million goal. So it's, a, it's, it's been, been very gratifying. Uh, the love and respect people have in the community for the Chrysler and their willingness to, to make that investment in its future. Uh, yes. How much more square footage is being added? Right. In terms of brand new square footage, 10,000 square feet, but that's um, that's a little deceptive because uh, more important than that is the way we've been able to reuse the square footage in the existing building much more efficiently. So it'll seem like it's a, a lot more new square footage and new galleries than uh, is literally the case. It's by recapturing and rethinking and improving circulation. You have such a wonderful resource of your expert. In the museum, would it ever be possible, or do you envisage having some sort of equivalent in the museum of the antiques roadshow, where those of us who've got bits and pieces which may be worth millions, or millions, back by grandfather, um, one could just drop in, say on a Thursday morning, bring your bits and pieces to us, and we will buy a vintage. Right. Uh, did you all hear the question? Uh, uh, the Chrysler, you're absolutely right, has extraordinary depth of expertise on our curators and our conservation staff. And um, essentially, how can we make that expertise more broadly available to the community? Uh, for example, might we do something uh, a little like Antiques Roadshow, where we invite people to bring in mysterious objects they have in their collections and let us identify them? Uh, I think the answer is yes. Our, our curators love seeing objects and talking to people and sharing their knowledge with the folks. And they are willing to do that at the drop of a hat. Just make a phone call and we'll, we'll hook you up with the right person. The one constraint we have is that we are not allowed legally and ethically to have any, to give any opinion on the monetary value of an object. Something the roadshow people are not constrained by. But as uh, employees of a nonprofit, we can say, oh, we think this was made in this place, and it looks like it's this, and it's material, it might have been used for that, and it's a particularly nice example of it. But we, we, we can't even speculate as to what its sale value might be. Other fun? Well, again, thank you very much for having me, and uh, mark your calendars. Uh, come visit us in April, but uh, take a trip over to TCC after lunch. You'll be, you'll be happy. Thanks again. I have a friend who, whenever she leaves me, says, have a blessed day. And I think we all have had a very blessed day. Thank you, Bill Hennessy. Thank you all so much for coming today, and I hope you will able you'll be able to come back next month, um, November twelfth. We will be welcoming um, someone from the Elizabeth River Tunnels Project, and also a member of VDOT. Um, as you all know, um, tunnels and bridges are a big concern in our area, and if you've been traveling around recently on the weekends, um, you know where uh, they're having closings at the downtown tunnels. So um, uh, these two ladies will be explaining that project to us and giving us an update, so bring all of your questions for them. I'm sure it will be very informative. And um, if anyone did not get one of our surveys, uh, please raise your hand. I'll be happy to come around and give them. Uh, we appreciate you filling out the surveys. Um, they help us know what sorts of topics um, you have enjoyed in the past and topics you might enjoy in the future. And again, thank you so much for coming.